I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today three proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Gallagher. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion, ensuring small business affected by this summer's catastrophic bushfires get the assistance they need immediately. Is the proposal supported? A very enthusiastic Senator Watt. Overwhelming support. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I'll ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and thank you to Senator uh, Gallagher for raising uh, this really important issue for discussion in the Senate. Uh, because this summer has been one of shock uh, and sadness and loss around the country. And for those living across regional areas that have been impacted by bushfires, the consequences have been absolutely tragic. People have lost their lives. They've lost the lives of local firefighters and residents. They've lost homes. Over a billion animals have been killed, wounded or lost their habitats. Large areas of the country have been covered in toxic smoke, uh, and we've all endured the extreme heat. We've also seen farms and small businesses in fire-affected areas um, be put under extreme stress. And many of these communities are now looking at how, after the tragic summer, they can move forward. They're looking at how they can actually uh, start to rebuild. Uh, and one of the major roadblocks to the recovery, to the rebuilding, is the challenge faced by many of the businesses uh, that help sustain those communities. Businesses that provide uh, important jobs and also provide important services uh, in those devastated communities in the bushfire zones. Uh, and these businesses often rely on the tourism that they get during the summer months, uh, during this time of the year. Um, but the fires, of course, as we all know, have kept, kept that crucial uh, summer business away. Uh, I myself have friends who live in Bright, uh, in the Alpine National Park area uh, of Victoria, uh, and they themselves are experiencing these challenges. The bushfires have kept uh, so many tourists away from that area, uh, and my friends uh, run a business um, and uh, they rely on the summer tourists to keep their bike rental uh, and wine business running. Uh, and at the moment, they're left wondering uh, exactly how they're going to make up that shortfall in their income. Uh, and of course, there are lots of stories like this across uh, those devastated communities. And I think of Michael Lee, whose story was featured by SBS. Uh, he's a motel owner from Lakes Entrance in Victoria. Uh, and during the months of January and February, um, his motel uh, is, of course, normally fully booked um, with guests who've come not just from around Australia, but from all over the world. Uh, and they've travelled to experience the amazing things that we have on offer uh, in eastern Victoria, the amazing wildlife, the scenery, the food uh, and wine that we're so well known for. But when news of the bushfires spread, um, almost all of Michael's guests, um, they cancelled their bookings. And despite this challenge, uh, Mr Lee uh, did an incredible thing. He opened his motel up to the volunteer firefighters who were working so hard to put these bushfires out. Uh, he offered free accommodation to emergency services uh, and also to those who had been evacuated from their communities. Uh, now, businesses like Mr Lee's um, and others who are struggling to survive, uh, they need our help. Um, and of course, on top of the bushfires, we have uh, the coronavirus travel ban 
uh, and that has created a double whammy for those tourist reliant communities um, with the loss of even more business coming into the state. Uh, and right now many businesses are wondering where the help is going to come from. Uh, it is incredibly important that the government gets support to these fire affected communities and these businesses fast. These businesses they need help now. And we absolutely welcome the government's announcement of support and help for impacted businesses in the form of grants and concessional loans. Um, the calls from the business community to provide those funds um, have received support from the government, but the government does need to go further. There needs to be a case management approach to the people who need help, a case manager who can take into account the unique circumstances of a business and help them cut the red tape to access payments faster. There also needs to be continuous and ongoing consultation with business over the response uh, and the support provided now and into the future. Um, we want to see a business task force set up to provide advice to government from those businesses on the ground so government can understand what is actually happening for businesses right now on the ground. Uh, and of course, the real test of all the commitments that have been made and all the assistance uh, that has been announced by the government um, is in the implementation. It's whether it really gets out into the communities that need it. And with the feedback that we've been getting from businesses in affected area, um, areas, uh, it does sound like, despite um, best intentions, the money is just not flowing fast enough into those communities uh, that need it the most right now. Uh, and again, uh, this is the critical time for these businesses. Uh, many of them do 50, 60, 70 per cent of their annual turnover in this holiday season uh, during December and January, uh, and they've just lost that amount of their trade. Uh, and so it's incredibly challenging for them to see how they can continue forward over the rest of the year. Um, and a lot of these businesses have reached the end of January and into February, and they just haven't had enough money to pay their bills. So they need to be able to access the funds that have been made available uh, right now without delay. Uh, they cannot wait for months. Uh, and uh, if they can't access those funds, then they face the real risk of going out of business. Uh, and unfortunately, we're hearing story after story of businesses that are being held back from accessing the support that's on offer. Uh, because of uh, the red tape that appears to be involved in making an application. Um, we're hearing about business owners who are filling out 15 or 20 pages of forms and then being told that the program application has changed uh, and that they need to start all over again. Uh, and businesses that need a cash injection but are concerned about taking the government loans uh, because uh, it will put them into more debt, we're also concerned about those businesses. The government also needs to remember that it's not just businesses that were directly in the path of the bushfires that need help, that need assistance, um, that have been impacted this summer. Uh, in my home state of Victoria, um, I've spoken to businesses that were far away from the fires, uh, but of course they've also seen a dramatic reduction in the tourism and trade that they're doing. Uh, because these fires have scared so many people away from large parts of regional Victoria. Uh, and right now, if your business hasn't been uh, directly impacted by the fire, um, then there isn't a lot of support available to you. Uh, so I'm really worried that there are still many small businesses that are out there, um, some of which we're yet to hear from, that are, call that are falling between the cracks of the support uh, that is currently on offer. Um, so I encourage the government to find a solution to that problem because many of these businesses really can't wait too long. Um, there are lots of innovative ideas that business is putting forward to help support them through this crisis and we all need to listen to those ideas. And of course in the long term these communities, these businesses, um, they need action on the underlying causes of the bushfires this summer, on the underlying causes of the longer, hotter 
and drier fire seasons that we're experiencing in Australia. They need action on climate change. Uh, it's time that we confront the reality that our climate is warming and it's human activity that is driving it, because the science is in uh, and it's been in for a long time. It's time that the government listened and took action, unified action. Action to cut carbon pollution and action to invest in renewables. Because if we actually care about the future of these businesses and the communities that they support, then we absolutely need to be committed in this place to real and demonstrable action on climate change. Uh, and so it is concerning that over the last two weeks that we've been back in Parliament, back in Canberra, the government's been more focused on its internal divisions than solving the big issues facing uh, the communities that I've been talking about. Uh, and on the day that the Parliament had dedicated to paying tribute to our brave firefighters and to honour those we lost in the bushfires, the National Party was spending that day fighting over their leadership, uh, and that was absolutely shameful. Um, it pulls the focus away from the real issue, Senator which is Walsh, getting real help to those communities. Senator Walsh, your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Sp uh, President. As we all know, the devastating events of the summer have had a catastrophic impact on regional Australia. If ever there was a time for the entire nation to rise as one and help each other, it's now, and it will be for some time to come. Before the bushfires arrive to take lives, destroy home and ruin livelihoods, regional Australia was already suffering under the crushing weight of what seemed to be a never-ending drought. For so long, the downpours that we've witnessed in recent days were merely figments of tortured imaginations as farmers and land managers waited and hoped and prayed for year after dusty year. Of course, as we've come to expect in this often harsh land, Mother Nature delivered on those prayers, but not without packing a sickening punch. Regional Australians have been suddenly left to deal with flash flooding the latest insult to so much injury. The extent to which Australians have opened their hearts and wallets to help those directly impacted by the bushfires proves beyond any doubt that we are a compassionate nation, quick to sympathise and empathise with those plunged into despair and loss and ongoing hardship. It's that belief in the intrinsic generosity of Australians that emboldened me to launch the Go Country for Christmas campaign last year. So first, it was Go Country for Christmas, an appeal to encourage Australians to support regional businesses as they struggle to overcome the horrible economic impacts of the drought. The faith in Australians to rally around each other was only reinforced by the way in which Go Country was embraced sincerely as a bipartisan initiative. For all our political differences, we do share the need to think outside the compact worlds of metropolitan areas and reassure the 10 million regional Australians that they will never be forgotten. I've been delighted and indeed inspired by the support of 42 colleagues across the political spectrum. A gentleman got in touch recently via Twitter to comment on the increased volume of packages that had gone through Australia Post, and one business had an order of 40 jars of mayonnaise in one go. But one message that I received just before Christmas was particularly humbling, that to know that we had literally helped keep the doors of a business open. Louisa Morris runs a small sole trading business located in Wagonia North, East Victoria, manufacturing preserves and cakes. She uses ingredients that are available locally, including those from other Go Country registered businesses, buying direct from the grower and manufacturer. This is what she said. I grew up on an irrigation property between Berrigan and Tokemore, New South Wales. I'm a single parent to three children, two of whom are on the autism spectrum. What the campaign has meant for my business has been great sales compared to this time last year and the confidence with this cash flow to keep trading into 2020. I'm very grateful for the wonderful support that the Australian public and a few overseas customers as well have given me and my family. She continued. My business was in the process of winding up after 22 years of trading. The sales from this campaign have been amazing for my little business. I have the confidence to keep trading. And it's not too late to still support small businesses in rural Australia. These businesses are run by families who are seeing tougher times than most, 
and choosing to do business with them can make the world of difference to that small business and to that family. It's beholden upon us all to never forget that long have the fires have been extinguished and floodwaters have subsided, the suffering will continue. It's not just primary producers who need our support. The coastal regions, with many depending on tourism as a central plank of their economies, will also need all the help that we can muster. After we saw thousands of holidaying families flee the New South Wales and Victorian coasts over the new year, it would warm as many hearts to see them head back for Easter, next Christmas and beyond. From the surf to the snowy mountains and all the valleys and plains in between, businesses will be bleeding and we can all join together in stemming the flow. This would give local businesses the boost they so desperately need in generating hope and momentum for their recovery. But there's help that we can provide every day by buying Australian at the supermarket, whether it's fish, milk or dairy, we can all make a difference. If you're a tradie looking for a new twin cap, why not head to Bathurst, Wagga or Tamworth? And I'm sure the local dealerships will be ready to do you a great deal. The next time you're stocking the cellar, remember that Australian wines are considered to be amongst the finest in the world. Think of Mudgee, perhaps Senator Farrell's Claire Riesling, the Hunter, the Yarra, Margaret River, and think of the difference you'll be making to so many lives. Go Country began as a way to help businesses purchase it by purchasing Christmas presents from retailers outside the cities. But I'm proud to announce that Go Country is here to stay 24-7 every day. It's with great pride that I can announce we're about to launch a new website, Go Country for Anything. With the same support enjoyed by Go Country for Christmas, we can all go to the next level. It's time to start having a closer look at all our labels and remind ourselves of the debt we all owe to decades of thankless toil from regional Australians who built the vertebrae for the backbone of this nation's economy. We've got to remember that cheaper is not always best and remind ourselves to save in the long term by banking on the enduring quality of Australian products. Regional businesses are our quiet achievers, but their achievements have been monumental in making Australia great. And now, more than ever, it's the time to show our deep gratitude and keep expressing it as regional Australians try to get back on their feet. As a young mother, I worked with my family to manage farms in Moree. The day-to-day -day suffering of those stricken by the drought will have a profound and lifelong impact on me. I've seen the pain. I've felt the pain. I've seen the tears and shed my own. My own family was living it and breathing it choking on the same red dust. In recent days, plenty of friends have been breathless in telling me that their youngest children are seeing grass for the first time, and the spectacle of a creek running for the first time in a decade is a sight to rival Sydney Harbour itself for its beauty. Such has been the relief, but any veterans of the land will have that respite instantly tempered by the real and thoroughly justifiable fear of the next challenge. And that's why we all have a role to play in helping to provide the peace of mind that has eluded our country cousins for so long. Apart from the regeneration of the bush that will follow the fires, the entire nation can renew its resolve to help one another. Go Country strikes at the heart of our fabled national spirit, and it gives me, gives me great pride to know that everyone in this parliament will promote this campaign whenever and wherever they can. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, the bushfire crisis has wrought unthinkable devastation on our communities, our environment, animals and the country. One that we will unfortunately remember for years to come. Lives and livelihoods have been lost, along with homes, businesses and properties. It has been a tragic time and it is hard to imagine the stress that small businesses in affected communities have also come under. Summer is normally the busiest time of the year for many small businesses in New South Wales, especially in the regional areas, but many are struggling to stay, stay afloat and make income at all in the aftermath of these devastating bushfires. In my home state in New South Wales, where fires have been burning the longest, the crisis has had devastating impact on local economies and hence local communities, 
Small businesses in affected areas are at the brink. Many are unsure whether their businesses will survive into the next year. I met producers from Cabago recently in the, on the um, New South Wales South Coast where bushfires have created carnage. Cabago is now best known as the town where locals refused to shake Prime Minister Scott Morrison's hand, and rightly so. It was heartbreaking to hear that the producers had lost almost all of their growing capacity on their farm in the wake of these bushfires. They stand to lose the farm, but they do not qualify for any assistance in the current offering from the government. They are not asking for a blank check, but support to get back on their feet. And they should be provided that support. This must be a serious wake-up call for this government to not only do everything they can to help people get back on their feet, but to also tackle the climate crisis. Communities across Australia, from city to country, and from every corner have pitched in. We have seen the spirit of our community rise and overcome the devastation and tragedy that people and country have suffered. Perhaps it is impossible to ever know the true cost of the bushfires, but we know that people across the nation have rolled up their sleeves and got to work, and they deserve all the help they can get. Now it is on the decision makers to step up and to do their job. The government must commit to serious action on the climate crisis. Without this, we risk further exposing communities and local economies to future disasters of unprecedented severity. We have all the evidence. We have been warned by experts over and over for decades. With its inaction on climate, the government is leaving all of us exposed to a dreadful future where more extreme weather events will become more common. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of the matter of public importance by Senator Gallagher, which uh, ensuring small businesses affected by this summer's catastrophic bushfires get the assistance they need immediately. On January 19, the government announced with great fanfare their package to assist the tourism sector given the severe impact of the bushfires. The following day, 20 of January, again with great fanfare, their assistance package for small business was announced. For a while there, and there was an announcement a day it was released by the government. But Unfortunately, that appears to be all there was, announcements. Lots of spin, but very little substance and actual help for struggling small businesses, particularly those regional tourism operators whose businesses face closure unless they get help. By January 23rd, as small businesses on Ka Kangaroo Island on the south coast Small businesses on Kangaroo Island, small businesses on the south coast of New South Wales and in Gippsland were letting us know that the government's assistance package wasn't all that it claimed to be. Many of these small businesses and regional tourism operators are located in regions that have been struggling to deal with the impacts of the fires since last October and November. Holiday makers and visitors have been staying away from regional communities, many of which have not been directly affected by the fires. It is just not the fires that have kept people away. The safety warnings, road closures and smoke haze has also kept people away. Small businesses in fire affected areas need financial assistance now, not a complicated assessment process for concessional loans, loans which very few businesses qualify for. And even if they do, it's piling debt upon debt because these businesses have lost a substantial amount of, of their revenue. Many businesses faced immediate closure unless the government acts. Regional communities rely on the cash flows from small businesses to generate and maintain local employment. When no one comes to town, that cash flow dries up. Tourism markets in the reg regions are closely entwined. If one business suffers, it can quickly have a knock-on effect and impact the entire region. The government doesn't seem to have been aware of this when developing their assistance package. In Gippsland, look, Senator Mackenzie, who's got a bit of form here, Senator Mackenzie's got a bit of form here. She obviously hasn't been listening or talking to the people that have been going around Parliament House this week and telling, pe telling, telling everybody. 
tell it. Well, you should know then. Order. You should know that these packages are not doing anything that you're in trying to pretend that it's happening. Trying to pretend it's, um, that is happening. The people have been here going around talking to um, parliamentarians, telling them, pleading with them that what is being offered, whether it is with good intentions or not, is not working. These people have lost, many of them, 100 per cent of their income, others up to 80 per cent of their income. People have lost jobs because they, they haven't got income. That's what's happening. They have said that the loans that's on offer will not be able to help them. And, you, and it's quite simple as to why. Because if you're offering loans, you're just piling on debt because there's no revenue there to pay the debt. Labor doesn't believe this is right. So it's OK to come in here and, and say that you've been talking to them because you obviously haven't been listening. So what Labor has been saying to this government is to listen to the people that are affected, listen to the communities that are affected and make sure that the uh, assistance packages actually work, because they're not at the moment. The money's not getting through. We know that. People and communities are telling us that. It's, you know, it's really not very hard to actually get in there and fix up your, um, the way that you put this assistance forward and, and add more. Add more. Because, quite frankly, if there's not an immediate Senator Brown, your help, time then has expired. Then Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I welcome the opportunity to stand in the Senate uh, this week after the horrific start to 2020 that so many regional communities experienced uh, as a result of the bushfire season. And we know it's really only the start of the season. Uh, this will be going for uh, more months to come now. And to be able to speak about the resilience of regional Australians, to be able to speak about uh, the recovery effort that our government, alongside state governments and local governments, has been delivering not just in the Adelaide Hills, not just in Kangaroo Island, not just in Corriong and Talangada and Kajiwar in my home state of Victoria and down in Gippsland where I was able to uh, visit with the community in Omeo and meet some uh, bushfire-affected farmers a couple of weeks ago. The, the absolute effort in Mallacoota and East Gippsland, a fabulous holiday destination for so many uh, regional Victorians over summer, uh, but also South Coast, New South Wales, and to visit with the member for Cowper, Pat Conaghan, um, his communities, such as Kempsey and the like, who'd been experiencing fires along with Port Macquarie uh, prior to Christmas. So this is something that regional communities have been dealing with for a long time. And because our side of politics understands these communities, we live in these communities, we raise our children in regional Australia, uh, to be lectured by the sanctimonious, self-righteous left, the Labor Party and the Greens, I might add, on you know, how best to assist small businesses and regional communities in the urgent response phase, in the recovery phase, which will actually uh, go on for many years, um, really goes beyond the pale. Because our government has been supporting families, farmers, small business owners with a $2 billion uh, bushfire recovery agency, which we are rolling out in response to ongoing demands as they uh, arise. This is a comprehensive program of assistance, not just loans. There are uh, grants available. There are financial counsellors available. I'm going to run through all the assistance that our government's providing for small business owners out in regional communities. And we're not responding, I guess, to people that might have turned up at a parliament house this week and are, are choosing to speak to certain senators about the issues. Uh, we're responding on the ground in response to direct 
advocacy of people in that moment, because that's what we were doing in January. That's what our MPs were doing prior to Christmas in these bushfire-affected communities. So our response is very much grounded in the lived experience uh, of small business owners. So payments have been going out the door uh, straight to those who are in need of financial support right now. Our farmers, our fishers, our foresters. Uh, very quick disaster recovery payments for them with that very urgent assistance required uh, to rebuild, to refence, to get that second generator. Um, we've also got a whole suite of initiatives for small businesses. So we've got 3.6 million taxpayers as of February the 4th affected by the bushfires, and that's around 60,000 uh, businesses who are lodging monthly activity statements um, that we're actually giving them the assistance that they don't need to do that. When you're struggling uh, with the fact that your community's gone through um, catastrophic bushfires, getting in your monthly BAS statement is the last thing you need to be worried about. Um, so we've made sure that they can defer those statements, lodgements, until May the 28th so that they can concentrate on much more pressing issues. All disaster recovery and relief payments made to businesses uh, impacted by bushfires will be free from tax. And between um, our responses, eligible businesses are able to access loans of up to half a million dollars. That is, those businesses that have suffered significant asset loss or a significant loss in revenue. And that recognises that those small businesses in the south coast of New South Wales uh, that haven't had the flood of tourists out of Sydney and Canberra that they usually would have enjoyed uh, during the summer season. Along the east coast of uh, my home state of Victoria, Mallacoota and the like. This, our assistance actually recognises that loss of revenue. Uh, we're also recognising that some, some small businesses have been directly affected by the fire themselves. Um, I was able to meet with Kim and Sam. Uh, IGA owners in a small town of Batlow that was affected. Uh, fabulous cider festival there. In a couple of months, I recommend everyone gets out there and supports that community. But given Batlow was cut off, given Batlow was cut off uh, for so many days and indeed a couple of weeks because of uh, falling trees and the like, and the uh, risk of ongoing fire, um, that IGA when we were there was actually unpacking a 10-door freezer worth of stock. And they only had one generator to keep the other 10 doors going. And so to be able to go through significant loss of stock, significant loss of revenue is a problem. And I know um, Australian significant generosity has been great, but as always, uh, we in the National Liberal Party support buying local. So I think our government's response in terms of giving these loans to small businesses, and I want to correct something uh, Senator Brown uh, was insinuating. These loans are interest-free for two years. Next season, the tourists will be back. Australians will be backing small businesses, retailers, uh, tourism operators out in our regional communities. Um, so they're looking at one year's loss of revenue. These loans are exactly the type of tool that won't increase their loan burden and their repayment burden, but will actually help them with a cash flow problem that they have over the next 12 months. It's an appropriate response. We, small businesses can phone uh, uh, 1800 413 828 right now and receive an up-to-date um, and comprehensive information on a range of support that our government uh, has for them. Now, bear in mind the response to the bushfires, as comprehensive as it's been from the federal government and ongoing into the recovery and rebuild phase, uh, has to be complemented by our state partners in this, which is our state government. So there are also a range of state government initiatives supporting um, our regional tourism uh, areas. We in the National Party know that family and small businesses are the backbone of our regional communities right across the country. And we understand that because they are our butchers, uh, they are our bakeries, uh, they are our farmers, fishers and foresters. Um, we are standing by them through this entire phase. Um, you know, I met Sue and Paul from Clack Clack, just out of Coryong. That caravan park right now is usually full of people. Uh, unfortunately, because of the bushfire, it's not. Bookings have been cancelled. We know the impact the bushfires are having on our tourism 
industry, and we've recognised that. That is why we're encouraging people to get out of the city, to come out to our communities, to support our regional tourism operators. Uh, the Empty Esky campaign, what a fantastic campaign, and I'd encourage uh, so many Australians to take advantage of that. But we're also standing by our small businesses with real and practical support that will make a different difference to them. I guess because we in, on this side of the chamber believe that regional Australia has a very bright future and we know that uh, these small businesses uh, are the backbone of our regions. We know that bushfires are a part of what happens in our communities. Uh, we know that that's what happens, and rather than you know a rail that somehow, if we shut down every coal-fired power station in this country, that somehow there'd never be another bushfire, is absolute crock of rubbish. Absolute crock of rubbish. Absolute crock of rubbish. What about you know? I would like to know what the Greens and the Labor Party's view is on hazard reduction burning on how we manage our fuel load in our state and national parks, and what are you actually going to do about that? And why, in my home state of Victoria, does the state premier refuse, refuse to make sure recommendations after the travesty that my state went through on Black Saturday doesn't have the guts to stand up against the left-wing green mafia in Melbourne and do the right thing by regional Victorians and manage the loads, manage the loads, manage the fuel reduction burning. You know, mountain cattlemen, Tony Burke threw them out. The mountain cattlemen said, you know, these Labor guys, they're just pandering to their green mates. They're locking everything up, throwing away the key, and look what happens. It burns down. Eight years on, absolutely nothing has changed. As we respond as a state and federal governments to the catastrophic events of this summer, Yes, we're there with real relief, but the rubber will hit the road if we change the way we do business in managing our natural resources. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Hanson Young, just before you begin, Senator Hanson Young, I would remind the chamber that interjections are disorderly. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise to contribute to today's uh, discussion in relation to the impact uh, that the uh, terrible uh, fires have had on uh, parts of rural and regional Australia. Um, only on the weekend I was uh, in East Gippsland visiting my family's property um, that was ravished by fire um, just on over the New Year's Eve period. Um, walking through uh, that region, uh, looking at the absolute destruction that these intensive fires have had on areas that have previously never burnt before, uh, rainforest areas, deep wet gullies where the fires ripped through and have destroyed everything in their path, the rivers, the streams, the creeks that are now suffering as a result. And of course, while rain is welcome, um, the heavy rain has done much damage to the um, areas that were left um, naked after the fires destroyed everything uh, on top of the soil. Um, ash running into the streams and creeks, uh, polluting those creeks and rivers and creating even more damage. I mean, it is just a travesty. I must say, um, my um, five-year-old niece, as we were walking through um, my parents' backyard and seeing the charred um, uh, forest uh, and uh, hillside, um, there were some ferns that had started to sprout back. And she said, Sarah, isn't it good, isn't it so good to see nature growing back again? And she's absolutely right. And I think that emphasises um, the desire for rural and regional Australia uh, to get back on its feet. These towns, these communities who have been so devastated, wanting to rebuild, uh, to have signs of hope and to invest again in what it is that they do. And often that is showcasing Australia's beautiful environment uh, and uh, land uh, to not just uh, us as Australians, but to our overseas visitors as well. But of course, in the midst of these fires, where was the Prime Minister? Well, he'd bug it off on holidays uh, to Hawaii while Australians battled the flames the destruction, the horror, and the Prime Minister was up drinking some cocktails and having his feet up uh, on the beach. 
Australians felt abandoned by the Prime Minister in that moment. They felt ashamed that our leadership was missing in action, and they felt angry that the Prime Minister had turned his back on them. And of course, what we've seen since is a game of catch-up from this government. Announcements of money, but very real support getting on the ground. I was in the Blue Mountains the, week, the weekend before uh, Parliament resumed last fortnight to talk to locals there. They are furious that the money is just not getting to the areas it needs. The local council in that area has been given $1 million, despite having the horror fires and the destructions since September. Since September. Local businesses are crying out for support, and they don't want to go into more debt to battle through this next six-month period. They don't want to have to face paying double bass come May. They actually want the support they need to get back up on their feet. And while those ferns are sprouting and the children and the communities can see that there is hope in these areas, what is the Prime Minister doing? Because all he's doing at the moment is paying lip service, making it harder and offering false hope. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I'm delighted to stand up here today and speak in support, I guess, of the number of uh, Victorian small businesses, um, especially those in regional uh, Victoria, who have been affected by the devastating bushfires over the last couple of months. Small businesses uh, are often the lifeblood of our rural and uh, regional communities, and certainly many small business operators in my home state are doing it tough right now. Northeastern Victoria has suffered enormously especially in the months of December and January. And some 1.2 million hectares of my home state have been burnt. Hundreds of homes reduced to ashes. Many, many small businesses have experienced a loss of property, assets and plants. Now, this loss has been very difficult, very difficult indeed. And for many small businesses that have been lucky enough to have escaped the full force of the flames, they now also face the difficulty of reduced customer numbers. Now, one example uh, is Miller White Cheese Company. Now, this is a great example that I just wanted to briefly talk about. Uh, even though the Miller White Cheese Company was not directly impacted uh, by the bushfires, um, that doesn't mean that it, these businesses aren't impacted by the bushfires as a result of reduced customers through their front doors. For my colleagues who are not familiar with Miller White Cheese, this, um, this is some of the finest cheese that you'll ever find in Australia. And, in January and February, this is usually when Millua's, um, uh, I guess, trading hours are at, at, are its busiest of the year. But as you can imagine, visitors have stayed away. And time and time again, we'll find many examples, um, as no doubt we've heard from previous senators and uh, no doubt senators to come, where there are examples of many businesses that are really struggling. Now. The Millua cheese has not, um, I guess, made the kind of sales that they may have enjoyed. In fact, locals in the local community have reported around a 90% drop in tourism. Now, a 90% drop is something that uh, local businesses cannot recover from, and a 90% drop in tourism is absolutely extraordinary, and will put some small businesses up against a wall. Not only will they lose direct sales as they experience difficulty over the coming months, but they'll also um, you know, have an impact on the supply chain, right up all the way, in, in, in Miller White Cheese's case, to the dairy farm gate. Uh, there was one, I guess, representative uh, in their small business who was quoted online as saying that we're definitely feeling the indirect costs of the absolute loss of tourism in our area, our normally busiest time of the year. While so many have lost so much more, this is going to have so many long-term implications for the local tourism, accommodation and agriculture businesses. Even the milk that we are getting is telling the tale. I'm happy to say that uh, companies like Miller White Cheese have made the best of the situation. and In fact, they're sending their cheese stocks to, at, to, mar to markets and offering them free in many hampers. Another example, 300 kilometres uh, towards the Victorian border is the, in, in southeast Victoria, is Bruthen. 
It's a town where that they actually felt the full force of the bushfires. And you'll find many fantastic local businesses, in particular Bullant Brewery. Business at Bullant is down 80 per cent compared with this time last year. However, the beers are still cold and the food is still hot. Everything is ready to go. What's the only thing sadder than a pub with no beer? That, that's a pub with no customers. Now, these are just two examples, Madam Acting Deputy President, of small businesses that are trying to make the best of a very bad situation. There are hundreds more stories like this from the bushfire hit regions of Victoria, of small business owners trying to pick up the pieces, get back on track, keep paying their employees, keep putting food on their family's table. While we have seen the very worst during this crisis, we have also seen some of the very best, and Australians are railing to support those businesses affected by the devastating fires with movements like empty, sky, uh, empty um, eskies and uh, spend with them. Many small businesses have lost their livelihoods, including though, through the indirect consequences of fires such as the blow to tourism during what is usually the busiest time of the year. They continue to face economic uncertainty while they rebuild. The lack of visitors during what is normally a very busy time of the year has had an impact on many small businesses, worse than was the case during the global financial crisis. Madam Acting Deputy President, while the community rallies behind those affected, government must also step up to ensure that these businesses are being supported without delay. The process for businesses to access relief grants and loans, as promised by this government, must be simple and expedient. Unfortunately, we have heard many businesses crying out for support as they face obstacles accessing this relief loans, as promised by the government, as part of their small business bushfire package. The government announced that eligible small businesses can access loans of up to $500,000 if they have suffered significant asset loss or a significant loss of revenue. Labor is concerned that the government's promised package may not be getting to businesses that need it most. Clarity around who is eligible and the processes for applying for financial assistance is needed urgently. Many businesses across five affected areas are facing closure if they don't get help right now. Many rely on the summer season to get through for the rest of the year, but that season has almost you know, completed. And while we welcome the assistance and the, and the package that was announced by government, we must reiterate how imperative it is that small business receive funds to stem a cash flow crisis. While some grants and loans assistance processes have started in the last couple of weeks, it is important to note that these bushfires did start back in September of last year. Businesses need assistance as soon as possible. On the government's very own website, full details for small business recovery grants and loans in Victoria are not yet available, and this is really unacceptable. Coming soon does not help these businesses. The website also states that there are only 10 financial counselling staff to assist small business owners, but almost 200,000 businesses have been affected. These businesses need assistance. They should get it from the federal government and they should get it as soon as possible. They can't afford to wait next month, nor can they wait to the next budget. It has to happen right now. And while Australians spend with them, businesses in these communities need to know that this government stands with them. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Molan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, uh, President. Um, we're here today to talk about the vexed subject of support to small business, and it's small business uh, not only covering what we traditionally know as small business, but also agricultural business, farms being agricultural, being small businesses, uh, many being business, big businesses. And I'd just like to comment uh, to Senator Chacon, who, who at least spoke about small businesses and, and, to his credit, spoke well about small businesses, and we do understand the extraordinary impact that these fires have had on businesses, on individuals, uh, and we can mourn the deaths that have occurred within these fires—33 deaths, including 
a, a, a vast range of people. But I'd say that, uh, uh, that, that one, of the, one of the factors that I certainly noticed listening to the senator speak was that uh, uh, in New South Wales, the New South Wales government very quickly came to terms in detail with the proposition put by the federal government in relation to agricultural packages and small, pa small business packages and many others. I don't know for certain, Senator, but I suspect that the, the state government, who is responsible for delivering the package, in Victoria has not yet agreed to the terms. The state, the, certainly South Australia and New South Wales agreed them last, last week, and the money is flowing out. Uh, I think that's a very, very important thing. It may, the problem, if it's not being delivered in Victoria, and I can say this as a New South Wales senator, may be the fact that the state government has yet to agree to the terms and conditions. Uh, my exposure to this over many, many years, to disasters of this nature, uh, has, been ex has been essentially through the uh, activity of the disaster, whether it be famine, whether it be fires, whether it be uh, earthquake and tsunami, whether it be in Australia or outside Australia, I've seen the tragedy that we all speak about now as we speak about these bushfires. Uh, I've certainly seen it, and I've seen it up close, and I've seen it from natural disasters and the unnatural disaster of war. Uh, uh, I spent 19, 19 days from Christmas Eve uh, in the fire areas, 19 days, uh, travelling around the fire areas, providing support to people and reporting back to our organisation on how to help small businesses, individuals, large businesses, councils and many, many other people. Uh, that's a manifestation of the assistance that we have provided to everyone in these areas. Han uh, Senator Hanson Young, of course, forgot the nature of the MPI uh, and uh, merely stepped back into nowhere, stepped back to criticise Hawaii travels, stepped back to forget that the source of fires is three things. And as a rural fire, uh, as a rural fire bush firefighter, uh, 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 someone who has fought these fires for six days as well as travelling around the fire grounds, I'm fully aware that the source of these the uh, source of any fire is going to be fuel. And in these cases, in many, many areas, the fuel load was very, very heavy, was extraordinarily heavy. The second source is uh, a source of oxygen. The second cause of these fires is, is the availability of oxygen, which, because it was hot and dry weather, the source of oxygen was there. And the third, of course, is a source of ignition. And, and that ignition is, it was certainly there for any number of reasons many, many reasons. But what makes us vulnerable, what makes small business vulnerable, what makes everyone vulnerable is uh, the fact that we now live in the bush to an extent that we have never lived in the bush before. This government is helping small business. It's put out agricultural packages. It's put out small business packages. It's put out tourism packages. It's put $100 million into clean-up packages, $58 million into support for families. It's put $100 million into the $75,000 small business agricultural grant, $15 million in additional funding to the Rural Financial Counselling Service, and $50 million to support immediate work to protect wildlife and long-term protection. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, we won't be, uh, we won't be uh, lectured by Labor or the Greens on this issue. We help small business. We have traditionally, and we were supported by the population and by the voting population in the last election. Thank you, Senator Molan. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, um, Senator Molan knows uh, probably better than anyone in this chamber that the most important job of any government is to protect its citizens, and it has failed dismally with this summer's crisis. Uh, I'm very glad that Labor Party has brought this motion before us today to discuss the economic costs of climate inaction, because it's not often a discussion we have, especially with this mob on the other side of the chamber. We tend to talk a lot about the impacts of uh, climate inaction on our environment, on our ecosystems, on our communities, but we very rarely talk about 
the impact on the economy. Now, small businesses in the coastal regions of Victoria, New South Wales, Kangaroo Island uh, are really in the aftermath of these fires. And it's not just in the directly affected regions. I've had feedback in Tasmania, both on the east coast and the west coast, in the last week of January that their businesses have also been impacted, their bookings have been impacted, their sales of products have been impacted by these fires as well. And while it's OK to stand up in question time today, let Senator Birmingham and say we've disallocated $76 million to a, uh, a tourism fund, they've just been caught out spending $150 million on their own private slush fund. Straight up corruption, straight up criminal activity, promoting their own self-interest, their personal interest and their political interest. So how do Australians feel about that? There's also another slush fund we've found out about money we could be spending on our fire-affected communities. I'm glad we're having this discussion about the economic costs of climate change. This catastrophe, this crisis this summer, is predicted already in cost terms to exceed $100 billion. Add to that the floods we've seen in recent days from extreme weather events, a new record again broken in Sydney for highest rainfall recorded in a short period of time. The hail storms here in Canberra, the health effects from smoke inhalation, this cost to the economy, to small businesses, to individuals, to our GDP, to our surplus ultimately, however you want to frame it up, is going to be catastrophic as well. So I say to those people out there who all know climate deniers, I know some, especially in this chamber, one just spoke before he left. He said he doesn't like to listen to the evidence. That was a quote directly from Q&A. I say to them, talk to them about the economic cost. A lot of Liberal voters understand economics, they understand business and they understand the costs. This is tangible to them. It is black and white. It's a thing we should talk about a lot more because the costs of inaction far outweigh the costs of action, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. I do note that there's approximately five minutes remaining for the matter of public importance. Is there any senator who wishes to speak? Senator Wish Wilson. Well, uh, Acting Deputy President, if no one else was on their feet. Um, so we have seen this government when they were elected in 2013. Mr Tony Abbott, in one of the most ruthless and cynical political campaigns in this country's history, tear up all the parliamentary work that this parliament had legislated on clean energy, on transitioning our economy, on reducing our emissions. On the basis of one slogan, ax the tax, the cost of living, the cost of taking action on climate. Well, I ask Australians, and especially small businesses out there who are suffering, what is the cost of inaction? Because if you listen to the best available science, and I know Senator Molan and others on that side don't want to listen to that science, but if you listen to the best available science, we're on track for much worse, much worse in the future of this country if we don't rein in emissions and we don't show global leadership. Global leadership. This summer has to demonstrate to us that we are one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to extreme weather events from a changing climate, from a climate crisis. Australia stands to lose so much if we don't act. And while we have these unprecedented fires and we have these devastating impacts on small businesses in our communities, what do we get from this parliament? Well, today we got some stupid, hysterical debate in the other place about funding a coal-fired power station, government funding, taxpayers funding a coal-fired power station. On one hand, this government wants to put in money to prop up a dying coal industry with its stranded assets for its own short-term cynical political purposes. And on the other hand, they take $76 million of taxpayers' money and give it to small businesses who have lost their livelihoods from these f catastrophic fires, from these extreme weather events. It's actually sickening 
Acting, acting Deputy President, the hypocrisy in this. Australians want to see both chambers of their parliament, the House and the Senate, come together, put their political differences aside and act on climate change. Because while we can be kind and give public funds to small businesses, to farmers, to individual communities, while we can donate personally through philanthropy, the most kind thing we can do, the highest possible honour we can give our fireys, those who lost their life, those who have been impacted, the most kind and honourable thing we can do is to actually take the threat of climate change seriously and mitigate the risks, do what is essential if we're going to make sure that in future summers in this country, in places like the east coast, of Australia, in West Australia, in South Australia, in Tasmania, indeed in the Northern Territory. If we're not going to see more disasters, more crises, more sadness, more heartbreak, then we need to do something. And I am bitterly disappointed that in this week that we've been back to Parliament, we're back to the same old tricks, the same old debates talking about how we can prop up coal-fired power stations, talking about rubbing our hands together gleefully about new coal mines, pushing ahead with offshore oil and gas development, fracking, seismic blasting in Lake Macquarie in New South Wales. When is it going to win? When are we going to wake up and realise that we're at this time in history where we need to take strong, decisive action? We need to take radical action to curb emissions. We need to take the strongest possible action to act on climate change. We have no time left. The time to transition to gas to go the middle ground was 20, 30 years ago. So I say acting on climate is the best thing we can do for small businesses and our communities around this country. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Um, the time for the discussion has expired. I'll now proceed to the